Okay, good morning. Good morning. I believe we are on and ready to roll. Good morning, everyone. Please continue to enjoy your breakfast. And welcome to the fourth and last breakfast with the expert uh, for this fall semester. Uh, we've had a great series of presentations this year. Actually, this is the last one for calendar year 2014 also. And uh, to complete, you know, this, this series, uh, we have a wonderful friend of our program who is with us this morning, back by popular demand, uh, to uh, discuss the world of post-acute uh, care and uh, the transitions and reimbursement methodologies that are uh, happening today. Um, Mr. Louis Collier uh, was with us last year, early last year, and he presented as a part of this program uh, when he was vice president at uh, Wellmont Health System overseeing their post-acute services. Since then, he has transitioned to Reliant Post-Acute Care Solutions, which is a national management and consulting company uh, that provides uh, post-acute uh, services for healthcare systems around the nation. So he is continuing to do uh, what he used to do in this area, but at the national level, traveling quite a bit, as he was sharing with me this morning, and providing, again, expertise and management services to healthcare systems as they respond to uh, the uh, healthcare reform and as they engage with nursing home and other post-acute care providers uh, to ensure a continuum of hopefully efficient and effective service delivery for their patients. So again, as our healthcare world changes rapidly, uh, it's really great that we have uh, experts like Lewis who are willing to take the time to share with us what is going outside uh, the walls of our building and university here and to bring the practice world into our classroom. So thank you again, Lewis, for being with us, and uh, we look forward to being here. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not used to staying in one place, but I'm going to try to stand right here behind the computer and click it as I need to. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, this is one of the opportunities I get to actually take a break from what I do each day um, with a fairly hectic schedule and uh, meetings and presentations and et cetera, and, and to spend some time talking about really uh, an area that I've got a lot of passion about, that being the post-acute world primarily. And now with uh, bundled payments coming back into play, we used to call it capitation back in the 90s. Uh, for the first time, I think we're going to see bundled payments really come into play uh, in a very large format that we have to at this time. So uh, I don't know what the word expert means, but I can tell you I've been in healthcare for almost 30 years. I've been in it long enough to see things come back around two or three times. Okay. So if that makes you an expert, then, then I, that's what we see today. So. But anyway, uh, very uh, informal presentation as far as conversation. If you've got questions, feel free to stop or, or raise your hand, and we'll talk about it as we, as we move forward. I hope when you leave here this morning, you've got a better understanding of uh, what bundle payments are. We'll, we'll talk about some definitions in a few minutes as we get started, and also the uh, implication to healthcare systems, uh, especially regional healthcare systems like Mountain States and Wellmont and what they've got to do to survive in the bundle payment world. It is a very challenging time in healthcare. Uh, I will say this, and I've said this to uh, uh, skilled nursing facilities uh, and hospitals across the country. If, you, if you're providing a really good product right now, and you know what your costs are, and your outcomes are good, you've got no worries. And if you're not doing a good job on outcomes, your quality is not real high, and you don't know what your costs are, you probably shouldn't be in business. And, and that's pretty pretty much the bottom line today in healthcare. Uh, we do have an agenda. We'll talk about some national and regional uh, implications of bundle payments. Uh, we'll talk about the description of models that, that Medicare has come out with in, in the timeline and what we think are the, the phases and processes uh, for being able to, as a healthcare system, implement uh, a bundle payment philosophy and, and actually administer it effectively. 
I'm going <laughs> to just breeze through a couple of things. But, uh, and I've talked about this before, I think, when I was here last year on a different subject. But uh, Medicare, for the first time in Congress and, and really everyone in healthcare, has really started to focus on the post acute care world. Is everybody familiar when we say post acute what we're talking about? We're primarily talking about nursing homes. We call them skilled nursing facilities today. Long-term acute care, like a select specialty hospital, uh, home health, hospice. Uh, those are the things we talk about when we say post-acute care. Five years ago, we used the word subacute, and and somebody in marketing somewhere in healthcare decided sub was a negative connotation, so they changed it to post-acute. Uh, so anyway, post-acute is what we're talking about. There's a huge focus on the post-acute world. Uh, we've asked for really 30 years that post-acute or nursing homes be included in the healthcare delivery models and health systems and hospitals traditionally have chosen not to include them. Uh, since 2010 now, uh, every hospital and every health system in the country since 2010 have talked about what do we do now with post acute strategies. I will tell you this, I was in Nashville about a few months ago and I spoke to uh, 27 healthcare systems, about 80 people. Not a single healthcare system out of those 27, with two of the largest in the country being, re being uh, represented, have actually implemented a post acute care strategy as of today. And it's a little bit scary because uh, I think in the past most hospitals will take a wait and see approach. Uh, today we're not in a wait and see world. I mean, you've got to act, act especially on the bundle payment side. But as you can see, post acute side for Medicare uh, you know, is huge dollars. I mean, uh, and quality driven dollars are becoming the focus in, with uh, Medicare. Uh, for a Medicare patient, uh, that goes back to the hospital one time from a nursing home, they increase that hospital's cost 121%. Okay? So if you're a hospital today, do you think you've got a reason to partner with, with nursing homes just for that one reason alone? Absolutely. Okay. Just a couple of things on, on legislation pending. Everything you see through here, uh, Access to Medicare Act, you're seeing hospital readmission for SNFs, skilled nursing facilities come into play. Uh, Ways and Means Committee in Congress, you're seeing readmission programs come into play for nursing homes. Um, president's budget, $400 billion in cuts to Medicare payments, 33% uh, of the $400 billion, 26% are to post acute care providers. Okay, so again, everything you see legislatively pending, anything you watch uh, on the news, or anything you watch on congressional hearings, uh, you know, talking about post acute care now. Uh, post acute care targets, reduced readmissions, they expect that's an estimated $2 billion in savings, and then value based purchasing for post acute home health and SNFs again. As you can see, everything you look at, post acute is prevalent throughout that. Uh, Jonathan Bloom with Center of Medicare said what really drives the differences in Medicare fee for service spending is what happens to a patient when they leave the hospital. One reason, we're, and most of our focus this morning will be on bundle payments, but uh, in the past, the hospital had no reason to have concern about what happens to a patient once they leave the hospital setting. Today, they've got every reason to be concerned about that patient when they leave the hospital setting. Not just for one week or two weeks, but for 90 days. So for 90 days now, the hospitals need to keep up with where that patient is and their continuum of care, and what are the costs and what are the outcomes, and what will trigger a possible readmission for that patient. Bundle payments. Uh, definition. Uh, fee for service, we'll talk about just real quickly. Is anybody familiar with fee for service plans or fee for service payment? Traditionally, it's the way hospitals and doctors get paid. For every every service I provide to you as a doctor or hospital, I get to submit a bill and potentially be reimbursed for that. You said that the hospital's watching for 90 days. Are you, do you anticipate? I mean, they're getting penalized right now for 30 day readmissions. Do you anticipate that going to 90? Uh, I'm not sure the readmission will go to 90 for a while, but what you're seeing on the bundle payment selection is there, the hospitals are choosing the 90-day bundle payments, which means we're getting a lump sum for 90 days of care instead of 30 days of care. Oh, okay. So, and, and, and you'll see in a, reason, in a minute why they're choosing that 90-day option. Okay. Uh, but fee-for-service uh, is traditionally the way hospitals and, and doctors are paid for today. Think about this. If you get to submit a bill for every time you do a service to a patient, what does that encourage? More, More services. More services. What's it do for the quality? Does it matter what the quality is? Why? If I'm a doctor and I, I see somebody today and I, I do something wrong and they come back tomorrow, what do I get to do tomorrow? More services. I get more services. I get paid more. 
So I really get incentivized for being a poor doctor, if you think about it. Um, and it's the same with hospitals. You know, you don't do a good job on a hospital stay or a surgery. They come back and stay another 10 days and their fee for service, you can pay for it again. Moving to but to bundle payment, uh, you, that's not going to happen. So a bundle payment, a simple definition, is a single fixed compensation for a patient's stay and follow-up care. And we're talking about 30, 60, and 90 days. Uh, it covers all treatments and expenses. Thereby, the hospitals have to look at reducing costs and, and control the volume of services. So it's what we're talking about, and this is a challenge if you think about it in bundle payments, uh, knee replacement, okay? Right now, if you look at it, and, and you'll see some data here in a few minutes, we just finished a uh, program um, in a different area of, of Mid-Atlantic, different state. We looked at 10 nursing homes, and their, their cost to care for that knee replacement patient after the hospital stay, three or four-day hospital stay, sometimes it's two-day hospital stay anymore for knee replacement, Usually a 10 to 14 day hot stay in the nursing home for rehab and then four to six weeks of rehab at home. Uh, that 10 to 14 days period for those 10 nursing homes was anywhere from like $7,000 to like $26,000 for the nursing home. Okay, so if that hospital is going to be competitive in knee replacement, so they're going to collect $25,000 for a knee replacement, and that's got to cover all the costs for 90 days, can they afford to pay a nursing home $26,000 for 10 days of care? No way, no matter what the outcomes are. So that's what we're talking about. It's when you walk in the hospital now for the next 90 days for your primary di diagnosis, that hospital will get a lump sum of money and then they're responsible uh, for that care for that period of time. Everybody okay with that definition? As well as, as so essentially the hospital becomes like the payor. <coughs> you know, the, the, the patient comes in, knee replacement. They, they get the, the knee replacement there at the hospital. They're paid a lump sum. Patient discharges to a post acute rehab facility, the hospital is responsible for paying the rehab facility out of that pot of money they got for that pay, for that knee replacement, right? Eventually. Okay. Up front, that does that's not gonna be the way for the initial part of the program, but eventually that is the what will happen. Okay. And eventually you'll see physicians brought into that and home health also brought into the into that same scenario. The problem you got with that, if you think about it, there's not a single health system in the country that can administer that today. No, I mean the administrative there's I mean, no the way. Administrative cost, the administrative hassle, I, I can't right. imagine. And then what if you're a skilled nursing facility and you're going to start waiting, you know, 150 days for your payment? That's right. That's so right. It's, it's a lot of challenges. The initial part of that is Medicare will still pay the hospital direct, the SNF direct, and the home health direct, but it's still going to be lumped in as one final payment. Uh, you get paid for multiple services uh, under the bundle payment. They get one time for all the services instead of each service. We talked about fee for service. Um, it also includes post-acute care. And, and again, I can't say that enough. Uh, the post-acute care world really has more spotlight on them than they ever have, and that's good and bad. Uh, it's really good for the patient because the quality of care has been really heavily monitored and looked at. But most skilled nursing facilities, even the larger chains, are very challenged at having the resources internally to provide what they need to right now to, for the attention they're receiving. So it's been a challenge the last two years if you're a post-acute care provider, making sure you've got the IT platform, you've got the in-house expertise, uh, you've got medical staffing available, etc. And one simple thing to think about in the last four years um, is really up until about 2011 area, um, it was very unusual to see a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant in the nursing home on a regular basis. Uh, and even going back to probably seven, eight years ago, uh, and even some, and some still prevalent today, if you saw a doctor once a month in a nursing home, that was fairly standard. Today, the nursing homes that are really progressive, they're seeing physicians and mid-levels every day, or at least five days a week in the nursing home. Uh, and what we realize is, again, it's not rocket science, but the more touches you have on a patient, what? The better the outcomes. Okay, so again, we're starting to see that. So you're starting to see an increased uh, presence of healthcare professionals in the nursing home setting, which again, who ultimately benefits? The patient. If you think about it, I use this example a lot because, again, coming from the post acute world for years, um, you know, you take a 75, 80 year old patient. Keep them in a hospital 10 to 14 days, 45 days intensive care, step down unit, etc. And then we send them to a nursing home, and they and traditionally they might go seven to ten days and not see anybody. So how can you take an 80-year-old person that needed intensive care 
sent him to a nursing home. Don't really know what happened to him for until they came back to the emergency room for for, for a readmission, and then don't know if they even get follow up care for two or three weeks. And it's at first basically it's just not acceptable. And what's happened is the cost of that's caught up to it finally. So. Uh, Medicare does have a similar system of bundle payments already. We call them DRGs, uh, Diagnosis Related Groups. We'll talk about here in a few minutes. It's a key component of the bundle payments. Uh, and you will see physician payments included eventually too. Because right now, uh, you know, physicians really can be the driving force and are the driving force. And if they don't have a financial incentive to, to be the driving force, then bundle payments will not succeed without the physician's involvement. Uh, President Mayo Clinic said once you have a bundle payment, the delivery system can really do anything because the money's on the table, but the incentive is what? Get it right the first time. It's real simple. If there's a failure, this now under bundle payments, it's going to cost you to redo that service, not you don't get the bill for it again. That's the way it should be, honestly. I mean, you should get it right the first time. You should know what your costs are, and, and they should have to come back. There are extenuating circumstances. We know that. I mean, you've got the patient that's got multiple comorbidities, et cetera, that they're just not going to be, you know, a typical A case for that diagnosis, and that's okay. Uh, they're outside. They're an outlier. But for the most part, 75% of the patients should go through the first time with no issues. Uh, unnecessary services should go down. Also, it should keep the hospitals more efficient. Um, and it's one thing hospitals are challenged with today, and they're getting better, and we went through this at Wellmont um, a couple of years ago, is you've really got to know what your costs are for the major diagnosis. So for, for a knee replacement, you've got to know what your costs are. And give you an idea, we know, one hospital uh, used 14 vendors um, for the medical devices <coughs> for knee and ankle replacements. They narrowed it down to three vendors, and it saved them about a million and a half dollars a year in negotiations. Uh, but you've got to know what your costs are. If you don't know what your costs are, you cannot negotiate a mental payment. Uh, there's just no way. You've also got to know a ton of data in the post-acute care market, which we'll go through here in a few minutes of some of the things that we do daily. Uh, but but I'm going I'm to go outside just a little bit here because I want you to think about this. Most hospitals today, if you go back to the early 90s when capitation sort of was the buzzword, and, and out of fear, it sort of went away. I mean, we went to HMOs, we went to managed care contracts, really were the result of capitation. So we really never truly went capitated. Um, but with bundle payments coming, if you're a health system and you know your cost, you've got good quality, what can you do with that? Can you increase market share? Yeah, absolutely. So while most health systems have some fear today of bundle payments because they don't know all the details and the calls, it's an opportunity for a healthcare system to really increase market share. I mean, if I'm in a competing market, uh, like you've got, you know, we've got two major health systems here, and I know my knee replacement is $4,500 less than a com the competitor, I'm going to go to every large employer and insurance company in the market and say, hey, why would you send anybody to my competitor? It's going to cost you $4,500 every time you do that. Uh, and that's happening today. I mean, if you're an employee of Lowe's or Walmart and you need a heart bypass surgery or you need knee replacement, they send you outside this area. You know, you go to Knoxville for knee replacement, you go to Cleveland Clinic for heart bypass surgery, and they'll fly you and your family to each place uh, and, and still save money. So it's an opportunity for a healthcare system. Th this is not fear. You know, if you fear this situation, if you fear high, better quality, and you fear not what you call store, you shouldn't be in the healthcare business. I mean, it's, it's a great time for opportunity for healthcare systems. And I spoke about that at a small hospital. There's a hospital in Seattle, um, and I just drew a blank. Had a senior moment. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll think about it here in a minute. But there's a there's five health systems in Seattle. One of them is a single hospital unit, about 500 beds, and they are thriving because their customer service is exceptional. They call it patient service. They know what their costs are. The quality is better than the other four larger competitors. And they're like, you can't survive as a single hospital today in today's market. They're surviving and, not all, and they're thriving. And I think that's the result of healthcare. I mean, it's an opportunity for hospitals to do better and survive and not go out of business. The ones that are going out of business are purely uh, from a point of view that do not understand their costs and they have, have issues with quality. Opposition to bundle payments, obviously. Why would you have opposition to bundle payments if you're a healthcare system? 
I think one thing that comes to mind again is the hospital, not now, but eventually becoming the bank, you know, becoming the payor. Yeah. That would, I mean, I, right off the hand, I think, who, who could afford that overhead, that administrative cost? Um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's a ton of extra work on their part to shop around for which subacute is going to provide the care. Uh, and then, of course, in, in health care, there's, there's, there is, it's not like you're making boxes. You know what I mean? There's not a one-size-fits-all. I would respond to any replacement completely differently than you would. I may incur more costs than you would based on my rehab. Who knows? Nope. So how can they how can they say it's going to be one way all the time? Right. Absolutely. So that's where, you know, getting into, again, if you're a skilled nursing facility right now, knowing your costs mm -hmm. and, and your quality and your outcomes, if you're able to get a knee replacement in and out in 10 days, we know a knee replacement, <coughs> the lowest cost for a knee replacement is leaving the hospital and going home to home health. There's no question. The largest part of that cost you'll see in a graph in a few minutes is skilled nursing. So if you can eliminate that or reduce that, so if you're a skilled nursing facility and you can cut it down to eight days instead of 14 days, you don't think they're going to be included in bundle payment options for that healthcare system if their quality is good? Absolutely. The other problem I had was I never just had a knee replacement. Yeah. It was There were several comorbidities that went along with that geriatric patient. COPD, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Right. Never just Everybody come in and got one. Yep. No. I mean, nursing facilities are the hospitals of 20 years ago. Yep. It's not, they don't, they're just not these walkie-talkie patients well, that come in for rehab. They've got other comorbidities. And actually, right now, the, 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 the scope of the acuity of a patient is greater. If you walked in a nursing home today in the Tri-Cities, the acuity level on that patient for that facility is higher than the hospital. Does it make sense? Why well, hospitals are getting them out quicker. So they're sending patients to some sniffs that really aren't even prepared to handle that patient at an earlier time. That's another key component of what we're doing here. Uh, I think the other part of that too, you know, we, we didn't, you just touched on it, but really the differences in cost in regions. So we know in a bundle payment setting, and you know, we know in Los Angeles, the knee replacements can be more expensive than it is in, in Kingsport, Tennessee. I mean, the cost of living, et cetera, expenses, all that comes into play. Medicare's got all that, and there's a variation of that in the bundle payments, so we know that bundle will vary uh, in that situation. But again, in this region, the comorbidities here are phenomenal. I mean, about 90% of people over age 70 in this area, 90% may be high, but it's a large, large number, have COPD, diabetes, and high blood pressure. Almost everybody comes in over 75 or 80, almost always has those three comorbidities uh, in this area, in this region. And those are complications to administer and keep up with, which do complicate a bundle payment situation. Uh, Louis, I'm sorry, but Medicare adjusted the DRGs for risk. So they did risk adjusted well, DRGs to reflect the acuity of patients. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't they do risk adjusted bundle payments? They will. There'll be a risk adjustment. More than likely what'll happen will be a one through four scale and four will be a high, uh, high risk and there will be some adjustment. Um, in theory up front there is no risk adjustment. So you're, what you're assuming in your bundle payment cost, you're assuming that risk within that cost. So if you think it, you know eighty percent of your patients, you can do it for sixteen thousand, but twenty percent run your average to nineteen five. Then that nineteen five, when you submit for bundle payment, includes that the risk adjustment inherently. So that's something hospitals have to know about. I think eventually it will go to a risk adjustment one through four scale. So again, quality. Uh, and I've got a quote here from Don May, uh, American Hospital Association. Quality and outcomes. Okay, you've got to measure two things. I've talked about it already through the times. You've got to know financially where you stand, and you've got to know what your outcomes are. Third option includes physician services. Uh, and I'll put this statement in bold. Further motivate hospitals and physicians to manage care together. We start talking about what's called population management. And that is you get a group of patients in a certain area that a healthcare company will come in and say, we want you to manage this population. ACOs is a population management uh, concept. So you'll see like Humana come in and say, we've got 15,000 seniors in this market that we provide Medicare services for, coverage for, and you know, we want you to manage uh, this population for us. The reason I put that in bold, uh, when I was here, I think last December maybe, and spoke, I'm not sure exactly when it was, um, my, my topic was physician and hospital alignment. So what you're seeing is through this healthcare reform and through uh, a bundle payments even more, is you're forcing physicians and hospitals to work together uh, really for the first time in the history of healthcare. 
and it's been going on about five or eight years now, but, but you're seeing it more and more every day. You're seeing uh, more physician integration in the hospital settings. Uh, I'm seeing more physicians coming out of residency that really want to want a, to go to work for a healthcare system. They don't want to go out on their own and do private practice, et cetera, because, first of all, they're scared of, of, um, of what's going on in that market. I will tell you this today, and, and I think this is uh, probably a very, it's, it's a very large detriment to what's going on, and it's a concern of mine. It's almost impossible today to come out of residency. And, and over the last 30 years, I've worked with and hired probably 8,000, 9,000 physicians, and I still work with a couple of thousand today. It's almost impossible for a young physician to come out of residency and start an outpatient practice and survive. Almost impossible. As a matter of fact, I, I'm going to say it, it probably is impossible unless you're in the right situation or unless you're willing to take a portion of the income that somebody else is going to take. And I think that's the concern we've, we've got in healthcare that we've got to figure out how to solve somehow. Um, pilot programs, Medicare has piloted about six of the bundle payment programs throughout the country. They have had success. Uh, they've reduced payments. They've attracted patients wanting to be part of that program. Uh, mostly ACO's involvement, uh, but the outcomes have been very good. Um, and again, the ones that have survived in the pilot programs or have, that have done what better are the ones where the physicians and hospitals and post acute care world have really come together uh, and understand the model that's necessary uh, to efficiently survive in a bundle payment environment. So it's been really good in the pilot programs. There's a great pilot program in Houston. I've been uh, privy to, and they've had tremendous success. They've actually lowered their cost and increased their profit, profitability on specific DRGs in that program. Here's what happened. Uh, bundle payments came out about two years ago, and we had probably three or four hundred healthcare systems, hospitals select them. Uh, the last, uh, this past February, Medicare re reopened the ability to select a bundle payment. When they did that, 6,500 providers applied for bundle payments. Uh, and that's a little misleading, uh, and I'll tell you why they all applied for it. They realized something's going to take place coming down the road in terms of bundle payments. What Medicare said is, if you're in a bundle payment situation with Medicare, even if it's just one diagnosis code, okay, one bundle payment code, we will give you the claims data every month for 30 years for your health care system and post acute care facilities. They've never received that data in a lot of time from Medicare before. It's always two or three years behind. So every hospital now is saying, I want that data regardless of what I do because I need to know where my costs are. Okay, I need to know where the skilled nursing facilities costs are around me. So that's really the main reason for that. Uh, but there are 6,500 providers. As a result of that, uh, Medicare has delayed the on start, or the start and onset of bundle payments. It was going to start January. Uh, they pushed it back to April. It's probably going to be more like June because it's just an overload of work with the number of people involved now. Um, and as you can see, the largest variance in Medicare spending is post acute care component. You'll see in a few minutes with some graphs we've got. Um, here are some uh, pay for performance programs. New episode, we call episodic payments, bundle payments, uh, basically talking about the same thing. We're looking at uh, uh, three medical events and three surgical episodes that will be added. And you can see like hip replacement, knee replacement, lumbar spine fusion, refusion, uh, UTI, cellulitis, and GI hemorrhage will be included. Um, and they're really included because mostly right now they include a large spending in the post acute care world with these diagnoses. The other part of that is most of these already are being tracked for 30 day outcomes. I mean, so most hospitals know their 30 day outcome results of a knee replacement. They're already tracking that information. Uh, so that's why they're adding these um, into the post acute care world, I mean, for the bundle payment concept. Uh, penalties will be th uh, at 3% on readmissions. Most hospitals, if you look at them today, they, they've improved. Uh, most hospitals are usually about a 0.9 to 1.5% readmission penalty today. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it is, because that's on every Medicare claim. So, for instance, um, and, and I don't exactly quite remember, but for Wellmont and Mountain States, it's probably about $2 million each a year. So, probably about $4 million just in this market that were being lost on readmission penalties. The largest readmission penalty uh, is congestive heart failure, uh, and that's just a given. I mean, that's one of the ones that come with multiple comorbidities and, and challenges. Um, and these are the ones that you can be. Uh, penalized though for readmission, uh, 
Um, but CHF is the largest one and the, and the largest challenge. So what you're starting to see now with metal payments coming is uh, you're starting to see it, it's almost impossible to get a cardiologist out to a nursing facility, uh, a skilled nursing facility. So you're starting to see telemedicine come back into play at a level that's never been before. And the systems that are using telemedicine on CHF programs are really seeing great results very quickly. So what you're seeing is a new patient admitted to a skilled nursing facility. They're probably getting two teleconsults a week if they're a high risk for readmission CHF patient. And, and they're getting daily contact with cardiology. So for the first time, uh, you're starting to see the CHF readmission rates come down significantly in, in hospitals that have addressed those areas. And again, uh, the readmission for these diagnoses, it's all what's called all causes, okay? So if you're admitted for CHF and you come back in because you fall, you fall in the nursing facility or, or something totally unrelated to CHF within 30 days, it's still a readmission, okay? And that's not the fair part of the process, but that's part of the process. So it's readmission for all causes, it's not just the initial diagnosis. So to be successful, uh, you know, I really feel like you've got an integrated system of care, but you've got to know where that patient is from the time they enter the acute facility to the time they leave home health. Uh, so really for 90 days, you've got to keep up with that, that patient. Keeping up with the patient for 90 days, what challenges are present? What's the obvious challenge? Communication. Communication. <laughs> Huge challenge. Uh, different systems, the greatest challenge. Not moving two things. First of all, you're seeing hospitals and health systems buy skilled nursing facilities, and you're also seeing them sell skilled nursing facilities. Uh, the reason being, uh, hospital administration, don't, they don't know how to manage a skilled nursing facility. <laughs> so uh, I was with the system in North Carolina a couple of weeks ago, they own four facilities, and they're going to outsource the management to somebody that knows what you're, I mean, because it's two different worlds. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is you're seeing networks being set up, which is where just what I do really every day, but you're seeing systems that own multiple facilities in a, net, in a certain area partnering with the hospital, but not an ownership situation, okay? But you still are seeing hospitals buy nursing homes, but the ones that have already done that are realizing they've got to get rid of them or outsource the administration. It's totally different. I mean, when you bring a cute and give you an idea, yeah, if you've got a nursing home, everything is totally different than a hospital setting. The accounting's different, the billing's different, the healthcare's different, the protocols are different, the pathways are different, the medical records are different. There's nothing consistent. So what happens in a healthcare system is most people in the healthcare world in the supporting areas, uh, the back office areas, they don't see that. They don't understand that. So what they've done for years for the hospital, they want to do the same way for the skilled nursing facility, and it doesn't work. So they've got to be together through some kind of integration, but not necessarily an ownership situation. Metal payment uh, for care improvement. Here's what Medicare's come out with is really, they've taken 179 diagnosis related groups and put them into 48 bundles, okay? And that's the, that's the 48 major areas that metal payments will come into play. As a healthcare system, 
Uh, you can choose one of those 48 to participate. You can choose all 48, or you can choose any number in between 1 and 48. You can change quarterly. So if you choose five and all of a sudden you realize you've got your cost in a certain area and you want to add a sixth one, you can add it on a quarterly basis. You can drop it quarterly. To keep getting the claims data, you've got to at least maintain participation in one bundle payment. Okay? So most health systems and hospitals will do one bundle payment that they've got, they pretty much have an idea they will lose money in just to get the claims data to prepare for the future. Uh, you choose 30, 60, or 90 days as an anchor event, the anchor event being the hospitalization. Uh, most systems are choosing 90 days, uh, and it gives them a little bit more control of that process. Um, and you do have outliers, and, and those are eliminated. What what, the, what, CM, what Medicare does, CMS being Medicare, is that there's a price point uh, that's established, and that's chosen per, per each of those 48 bundle payments. And what happens is Medicare will take basically a 3% discount off that price point to start with, and that's going to initially start bundle payments. So you'll see a 3% price point being given uh, to Medicare on each bundle payment. Uh, they're currently paid uh, just like they currently get paid now. So if you, if you see a participant that's got post acute, the nursing home will bill for services, the hospital bills for services, uh, home health bills for services. Initially, the 3% discount only comes off the hospital services. Okay? That's, that's really phase one of bundle payments. That's getting everybody into the market to see who really can do a bundle payment, uh, who can administer bundle payments. If, if at the end of the, uh, um, at the end of the, the measuring period, let's say, so, and you'll see an example here in a minute, but Medicare takes that 3% bundle payment. So let's say it's $20,000 for knee replacement. They're going to take $600 and hold it per episode. If at the end of that, that measuring period, that end 12 month period, <coughs> you've done 200 <coughs> knee replacements and you, you've done them for a cost of 19,000. Okay. That $600 you're getting, that's, that's your money you get to keep. Plus you get to, you get some of the spend back. You get the 3% back as an incentive. For staying below that price point. If you go over that price point, there's no additional reimbursement. Okay, so it's all incentivized to get 3% back. There's no additional payment for going over uh, the price point. There's really Model 2, Model 3, and Model 4 is what's come out of bundle payments. Uh, model 2 is the most common that was selected out of the 6,500, uh, and that's including hospitals are choosing to include post acute care services in the bundle payments. Uh, and, and that's model two. And there's an example we just talked about. 200 patients, 90 day episodes, 20,000. It's 4 million per year. They get a 2% or $400 discount. And you see the price point's 19.6. So if the average spend is 19.3, they'll be paid by Medicare an extra 60,000 uh, for that. Okay. Now here's, here's the other part of that, and we'll get to it in a minute too. I think it's in the presentation. Hospitals can share that savings. Okay with skilled nursing facilities, with doctors. So they can incentivize even beyond uh, a, a, an agreed upon payment. They can incentivize on savings on bundle payment situations. And that's not viewed as a kickback or anything else. It's allowed under the bundle payment uh, regulations. These are the 48 bundle payments, and they're all the major um, conditions. I can not tell you the largest cost consistently for a hospital is on this page right here. Can anybody tell me what it is? Yeah, absolutely. Sepsis. Absolutely. Huge cost. Uh, it's a little bit blurry, but basically what this does, this come out with the ones that selected. I'm going to show you the pie chart here. 47, half the hospitals that selected bundle payments only chose one to five bundles. Again, they want the claims data. Okay, so they're choosing one to five. 34% chose all 48, but most of those 34% participate like in a group situation with like a large ACO, et cetera. So they're doing all that to start with. They won't maintain all 48. They just indicated they wanted all 48. And then basically 20% chose between six and 47. What I'm seeing is basically about five to eight bundle payments that a hospital can act actually effectively administer initially because that's about all they know where the costs are. And a lot of it's volume driven. I mean, out of the 48 D bundle payments, you know, probably nine or 10 of those 48 drive 75% of the cost and revenue for the hospitals and the other 
36 drives or 40 drive, probably 25%. So the volume is an issue as well. Uh, we talked about physicians and uh, other partners in there can be included in metal payment savings. Um, can motivate significant changes, and this is what metal payment and risk-based pricing, we call it episodic uh, payment as well, forcing co uh, cooperation across a continuum. Continuum is a total plan of care for a patient, okay, from start to finish. So hospital stay, SNF stay, home health stay, if an LTAC is involved, etc. But the total care, total plan of care uh, for that patient. The other thing it for is forcing is, is uh, <coughs> cooperation and protocols, and, and we now call them glide pathways, uh, glide paths, and um, standing orders. So what you're doing now in the past is the hospital would have protocols for a certain DRG. They go to a skilled nursing facility, they would have some of their own protocols, and home health have, has their protocols. With metal payments, you're seeing that being consistently applied, and you're seeing all three of those markets work together to make sure the protocols are now consistent. So you're seeing cardiology in a hospital setting work with the skilled net SNFs to talk about cardiology protocols in the SNF. They're adapting some of the medications because of cost, and then you're seeing home health participate as well. So you're starting to see all three of those major areas uh, come up and work together on a specific protocol and not try to have three different plan of cares for the same patient. Um, standardization of care models we've talked about. Uh, it is producing narrow networks, and that's really what... Uh, what I've done at Wellmont, I've done for a long time, and I do now, is really we go to a market for a hospital, uh, and the hospital being the anchor uh, facility, and we create a narrow network of post-acute care facilities. So mostly six to ten in a market, depending on the need. Uh, out of, if you run any hospital within probably a 50-mile radius, there's probably 35 skilled nursing facilities, and we're only choosing six to ten uh, to start a network with. So you can see it's a, it is a narrow network. Uh, IT connectivity. That's one of the areas we didn't have at Wellmont. <clears throat> we didn't have a way to electronically connect the post acute care network. We do with Reliant. We actually own our own proprietary IT system where we connect the networks from a financial point of view and a quality point of view. I'll show you in a few minutes. And we're moving you know, from the piece worker fee for service model back toward the episodic management. Uh, this is timelines we talked about. This is probably going to be pushed back now. Uh, you know, for actual bundle payment administration, probably going to be pushed back to June. It may start April 1, I'm not sure it will, uh, but it is moving in that direction. And really for phase one, to start really for bundle payments, uh, you've got to have, a, have the post acute care network, so you've got to start analyzing, you know, the post acute care facilities in a hospital area, geographical area, and see what the cost are per DRG and per bundle payment that you're looking at. And I'll show you some um, sample graphs here in a few minutes. And you've got to make decisions as a hospital, you know, which bundle payments will we choose? Um, are we going to do 30, 60, or 90 day episodes? Um, and, and then the shared savings model, how will we share any savings that we have back with the partners in the network? And then phase two comes in really clinical. You've got to talk about protocols. Transitions, huge, huge area for improvement. Um, and it's gotten a lot better. It's still not great. When we talk about transitions, they're still not a really uh, highly utilized, consistent transition handoff from acute to post-acute and post-acute to home health. And, and the healthcare systems are doing better, but it's still not quite there yet. So that's got to be a large focus on that. Mainly what we're talking about, the breakdown is a home medicine list, if you think about it. So if you've got a medication list coming out of the hospital and it's not accurate, up to date, and it's not shared with the nursing home or home health, that patient may go two or three days without specific medication, and what happens, they're back in the emergency room, back in the hospital admission. So the care trans the transitional piece has to be uh, critical in the process. So here's like a, some analytics that we do each day. A 90 day episode of spending for a specific hospital. We break down to 48 DRGs, or 48 bundle payments. We're highlighting here like congestive heart failure for this one. Their average cost is $22,000. Their comp competition is 20700 That's an area they've got to work on some improvement on fairly quickly because that's a large volume bundle payment um, in DRG, so they're going to lose some volume there if they're not able to fix that quickly. Uh, so what we're highlighting in most cases is what, what's the cause of concern that would lose uh, leakage or lose uh, volume for that hospital. Okay, so you're identifying that. This is some data that hospitals haven't had in the past. 
they get it, but it's two or three years in the back, uh, in arrears as far as timeline goes. Now they're going to start getting it in real time. So they want to know where they stand for competition. I'm sorry, where do you get, what's the source of the data now? Medicare. Straight from Medicare for the first time. Okay, so, so you can get it from Medicare and then aggregate it for the hospital mm -hmm. who's your client yeah. and uh, share it with them? You can. So and Medicare they, will that. Medicare will give you access as a reliant to the data? They do. And what happens is it's, it's just raw data given to the hospital, so they've got to figure out how to, you know, uh, extrapolate what they need for the process. So, but it is for the first time you're able to get a lot of data. And that's the thing about Medicare for years. I mean, they were fantastic, fantastic at gathering data, but they've right. never been good at sharing. So, yep. so that, that that's really the incentive here for these hospitals is yep. to get this data so they they can know, know and understand their costs and those around them. It's just, you know, that, that's really the incentive here, isn't it? Yeah, it is absolutely. And what's happening is it's, it's data that they can actually utilize. So what's, what happens is, and I think it, you know, in a business where it's about being data-driven, health systems have to become data-driven and in real-time data, not two years ago. Because right now, in the way it has worked, if we're looking at Medicare data today, in 2000, moving in 2015, we'd be looking at 2012-2013 data at the best yeah. until today's world. Now that's, we that's actually what get I saw it. as an operator. Is that well, I mean, when I, and I, let, me, let me qualify this. When I say they weren't the best at sharing it, that, that's probably a little biased. I mean, they, they share data uh, with, with me as an operator. For, I mean, as far as data specific to my facility, I would say, or specific yeah. to my business, that that I never got claims data. Right. I never got you know, I wasn't able to see that. I saw quality data, but even the quality data was, you know, a couple months old at best. You know, it wasn't anything that I could immediately act on. And now you're seeing true cost data, so it's right. the first time hospitals have seen it as well. Yeah, uh, can you speak on this uh, issue of? Uh, Medicare reporting and the earnings of individual uh, physicians. Because at the point in time, they were just releasing the reinvestment for some of the physicians. And I don't know what I thought about this whole concept of bundle payment. You're talking like the cost data for physicians? Yeah. Yeah, what's happening is it's not real accurate, but it's accurate per physician group, not per individual physician. Because if, they, if you've got a group of about 20 physicians, um, you know, you may have two or three physicians to treat somebody, so Medicare really doesn't know who the primary physician was, so the cost may get allocated uh, incorrectly to one physician, but if they're part of the same group, then the group the group cost is accurate, the individual physician cost is not accurate. Cardiology, for instance. You know, cardiologists, it's not unusual to see three or four different cardiologists from the same group while you're in a hospital, so the cost for that case for the cardiology group is accurate, but not for the individual cardiologist is not accurate. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But it is per group. It is still affected per group. And, and then we take, you know, then we take it, look at, you know, I didn't even break it down on, on this type of graph of where exactly do we need to work on. So like on, the, on this 309 DRG, you know, they got a huge area of opportunity or they're going to lose some market share there. And then we look at basically out of the 48 bundle payments, you know, days 1 through 30, days 30 through 90, and then overall, you know, are you lower than the market? Are you slightly higher or are you significantly higher? And, and what are the areas you can improve in? Sometimes you can't make any difference. You know, sometimes it's a volume issue. You only get six cases a year, and you just can't reduce your cost on six cases a year. So, but this is data for the first time again that they're starting to see in real time they've never seen before. Now, here's some here's what here's what we really do. This is actual for us a small regional hospital. 99 cases of a major joint replacement. We took all 99 cases. Data comes from Medicare, and then we break it down in in cost. The blue indicates the cost for the inpatient stay, okay, the anchor event. That's a fixed cost, mm -hmm. is that what you're saying? It's not necessarily fixed, but it's almost fixed. You can see the blue is almost identical across through there. Right. Um, so it's while they're in the hospital, but their hospital cost, mm -hmm. while they're in the hospital. Yep. So in most cases for a knee replacement or a joint replacement, it's two to four days, so the cost is going to be very close. What you're seeing very some in the green is the skilled nursing facility cost, and you see the home health cost. Um, and the yellow is a lot less. So what you're seeing, readmission, you're not seeing a whole lot of there. The, uh, the red indicates readmission. You see one case that had a larger readmission, but mostly you don't see any readmissions here, which is common. But if you're looking at this as a hospital and you're looking at it from a bundle payment point of view, where's your opportunity to save money at? And I think I talked about it earlier. In the green. In the green. So now, if you're a, now think about this. So I'm a hospital, and I've come out and, con and convinced you to join my network as opposed to acute care. We're going to 
survive together, and then we'll come back six months from now and say, oh, by the way, all knee replacements will go straight to home health now, unless there's complications. Are you saying, are hospitals approaching SNS? Because when I was an administrator, I was approaching, as you know, I was approaching the hospital. Totally opposite now. Really? Yeah. That's what, and that's what I'm doing every day is I'm going out and have the hospitals, you know, and, and interviewing and selecting six to ten SNFs out of 30. So I was progressive, is that right? Absolutely. Good. You get extra credit this morning. <laughs> but you can see what's happening is... That's you, point. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see with this data now for the first time you're really zeroing in on where are the costs being spent. Congestive heart failure we talked about being the largest readmission. Look at all the red. Oh, yeah. It's all readmission costs. This is 178 episodes of a hospital. So you take all 178 cases and line them out, and, and readmission's the largest opportunity for CHF. You start to see why the data is important. But there's an interesting relationship there between the red and the green. Yes. So it's yes. almost as if there's a correlation. As yes. the red increases, the green decreases. Right. So there's a negative correlation between readmission and sniff care. Yep, absolutely. That's Almost great. suggesting that sniff care can reduce readmission yes. based on that. And it can. And you're right, because look here, and right here just in this area, the largest sniff, the smaller the room, you're right, absolutely. We, you know, so we, we knew that, I just, this reminds me, we, we knew that CHF and COP were our big issues. We, I, I, I partnered with a pulmonologist at one point. And have him come over and do the interdisciplinary team meeting once a week. We started doing a pulmonary rehab because we saw this same thing. Yep. And, and, and on, on, in the, on the sniff side, on the, on the post acute side, readmissions are, are bad because eventually that that penalization is going to make it to us. But also because that's the, that's less days of their head being yep. one of my beds. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm incentivized to have a patient yep. in the bed for a little bit longer than they would in the hospital. And plus, the simple thing is as expensive transport and patient back. Right, which which we under prospective payment system, yep. under, and you know that you're you're going to eat some of those costs. Absolutely. So, yeah. <coughs> so what we do, I was going to give you a little bit of idea on reliance because this is bring to get a lot of things. We're actually, um, uh, and I was getting we were talking this morning. Reliant, uh, we're now known as Reliant Post Care Solutions. Reliant started about 15 years ago. And basically, it was reliant rehabilitation services, and the focus was rehab services within nursing homes. And that was the focus. Um, a good friend of mine, Joe McDonough, who's the current CEO of Reliant, actually was part of an investment group that bought Reliant in 2010. And he bought Reliant not for the purpose of building it up as a rehab company and selling it. He bought it for the purpose of knowing what's coming in health care reform, and he wanted to build a post acute care company nationally. So from 2010 to 2013, basically went out and acquired a proprietary IT system, started putting people together that had post-acute care experience. Uh, and we basically rebranded the whole company this year. We changed the entire corporate name from Reliant Rehabilitation Services to Reliant Post-Acute Care Solutions. So our rehab services are now underneath, and they're, they're one of our lines of service, but they're not our focal point at this time. And this, we got updated a little bit. We're presently in about 500 facilities as of December throughout the country, so we have a large presence in nursing homes. We're in 32 states. And we see about 25,000 patients a day. So when we start extracting data from our system, we're extracting that on 25,000 patient encounters a day. And here's what we've put together, and this comes from a lot of us coming from different backgrounds. Uh, but basically, we've, we made the hospital the focal point of the post care network. There's two, two, there's two other competitors that really are two other thoughts here. One of them is ownership. And, and Kindred Healthcare, you're familiar with Kindred? Kindred is basically, they own buildings. They own LTAX, they own skilled nursing, they own home health. They just bought Gentiva, or in the process of buying Gentiva home health. What they've done is they said, we've got 25 markets in the country that we own six to eight buildings in. We're going to go to those 25 markets and, and create our own network and go to the hospitals and basically force them to contract with them as a network. The markets they don't own those facilities in, they're selling the facilities. So if you look at <coughs> Kindred, you're seeing a sell-off in the smaller markets. You're seeing aggressive buying in the larger markets. That's right. So, but they're controlling the network. The other idea is you've got some people that want to go in as consultants, and everybody knows the definition of consultant. Can somebody tell me? And I'll give you my definition. You make a definition. Okay, I'll give you mine. You live more than 50 miles away. You have a briefcase. <laughs> okay, and you can charge pretty good for that if you live more than 50 miles away. Um, <laughs> But what consultants want to do is go to the payer. They want to go to Blue Cross and Humana and say, hey, you give us $300 per 
ensure you got this area, we'll go out and create a network for you. So what they've done is they're going back to the hospitals and, and post-acute, they're forcing a pricing structure back down them, not based on quality or clinically driven. What we've done is we said the hospital's going to be the focal point. It has to be. Why? That's where the anchor event occurs. Okay? So if you don't start the transitional piece and the educational piece at the hospital setting, you've lost it from day one. So we, we make the hospitals, and then we go out into the SNF world, and we identify six to ten SNFs. If we pick ten nursing homes today, uh, and if we just went out here and interviewed ten in, in, in the Tri-Cities area, the disparity among those ten is, is huge. No, no common protocols, no common clinical pathways, no, no common medical record software, uh, no transitional piece, no communication with the hospital in the same format, uh, no plan of care implementation in the same format. So the first thing we do from our side is we, we, unif we unify all the clinical side. So we go into to those nursing facilities and we implement protocols on all 48 uh, bundle payments. We implement with physicians and med levels. We make sure we're doing the same clinical approach across the table. And then in the hospital setting, we put a mid level and that mid-level does the education piece for the patient, not the case manager. How do you get, part of this unification issue is that you have such a diversified ownership of all these facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, you take an NHC, yep. 77 facilities, they have their own clinical pathways, right. and they're not going to budge for a little market up here. Maybe they will, I don't know. They have. Well, how, do you, how do you work through that? They have. They have them. Yeah, and what's happening is they realize the bundle payments coming, they've got to. So you're even seeing like NHCs of the world even outsource rehab services, yeah. et cetera, because they realize to get that constant chain of referrals, they've got to participate at that level. Now, here's one thing to think about, too, because it brings up another question is, or another point. Right now, with nursing facilities, they don't know when the next patient's coming from their largest referral source. Okay, so let's say you got a nursing home in John City, you don't know when the medical center is going to send you that next patient. So what do you do with the patients you have? You keep them as long as you can keep them. So all of a sudden in this network, if you know you're going to get two patients a day, what are you going to do? With the, what are we going to make you do with the patients you're keeping? You're get them out. Yeah. So we're going to reduce your length of stay, but what we're going to do in exchange, we're going to give you higher acuity patients, shorter length of stay, higher reimbursement. Right. So we're going to improve the financial picture of the nursing home as well. Okay, and that's key right now because you want to lock in that referral source. So we do that, then we tie the IT platform in, which is, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, I know we're running out of time. Our methodology, though, you can see is fairly detailed, our, our analysis of data. It's very data-driven, and it has to be, and it's also very clinically driven. And uh, affordable days, these come from the hospitals world. It's, uh, I'll give you just a real quick uh, overview. If, you, if, a if a hospital, is a, a physician in a hospital has a patient, and they're ready to be discharged for, say, CHF or whatever they're in a hospital for, but then all of a sudden they need to start them on Coumadin today. That hospitalist is going to say, I don't know what's going to happen to them when they leave today, so I need to first INR check two days from now so I can adjust the level of Coumadin. So I'm going to keep them in the hospital in three or four days to make sure I've got the right dosage adjusted. If they've got a post acute care network and they know there's protocols in place and they've got an IT platform where they can check to see if the coumadin has been checked or not, and they've got confidence in that PAC network, then all of a sudden they'll release that patient two or three days earlier. That's a real simple case, but it happens every day in hospital soon. Our pathways, there's 48 pathways on all the, all the bundle payments. Uh, we report, and this is an example of our IT system, a portal for a hospital. We actually show all the quality and financial metrics, live data on a web-based portal uh, that they can see, and then we do it per sniff. Okay, so you're seeing the data each day, a uh, lot of time. And then this is how we tie together all the clinical side. And, and I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to scan through it real quick. But it gives you an idea of the level of sophistication that's come in play, but at the end of the day, it's really not rocket science. It's unifying and making uniform the level of care throughout the state. And now we're looking at a 90-day state, not a 30-day state. That's what this is. From the anchor event to the discharge from home health back to your PCP, you've got to apply the plan of care throughout that whole process. That's the only way you can effectively manage bundle payments. Do you have any questions? Last, Lewis, last time you made you made a really good point on how this affects quality altogether. Can, can you make that point again? On the quality? On quality. How, how bundle, what, what effect will pay for bundle payments have on quality? Yeah, I think the biggest benefactor, without a doubt, is going to be the patient and the quality. 
because uh, the quality outcomes, you, you may be, let's say you can come back and prove that you're a lower cost provider or partner for a network, but your outcomes are not that great. You're not going to survive even though your costs are low. The outcomes and the quality has to be driven. Again, you still have you have some patient choice issues to work on through legislation, and those are that, those are actually being relieved a little bit uh, by Medicare. But the quality at the end of the day will will be the the biggest change of the whole healthcare system. It's got to be because again, you know, I've said this for years, is that you know there's a there's a tendency to look at financials. And you look at, oh, we're losing, you know, X number of dollars in this area, et cetera, et cetera. What do we do? Um, and then you, that usually affects your quality. My point's always been if your quality's at a, at a level it should be, all your financials get in line pretty quick. And, and that, that's pretty common sense. But if you're providing the highest quality you can provide, the outcomes are, great, are good, your financials will also reflect your quality. So I can look at a hospital that's not doing well financially and pretty much tell you the quality's not real good. <laughs> and, and on average, not every situation. Sometimes there's, there's extenuating circumstances. Um, but I've looked at a lot of financials over the years, and most of the time it's tied to quality or physician issues that come back to quality issues as well. Yeah, uh, my question is, uh, this uh, Medicare bundle that you mentioned, uh, Maybe, I don't know, you're talking about how they facilitated through the uh, AC, which is an affordable care. So, should there be any changes in the act, using that this form of uh, rare bed units going to change as well? Are you asking if metal payments affect the affordable yeah. care organizations? No. I said that uh, this form of payment has been facilitated by the affordable care, which is the AC. Right. So, my question to you is, uh, should there be any changes in the law for this form of payment also going to change as well? That'll, that'll affect the Affordable Care Act? So yeah. if, if the ACA were to repeal, right. will bundled payments go away? Don't think so, because that's a Medicare initiative. So I don't. Th I think where we are now, health care reform, even though you've had a recent change in Congress, it's not going to change because the focus is still post-acute world and the expenses of Medicare. So the metal payments are a Medicare initiative. Uh, that's going to continue, uh, just like the DRGs or Medicare initiative that have continued. So the metal payments have to continue. Uh, to whether all the, all the health care reform got repealed or not, you'll still see metal payments push forward. I think what you'll see is the, the, the ACOs that came out of the Affordable Care Act as well, the ACOs have really, there's a huge disparity on the performance of ACOs today. One of the key reasons, they don't have the data. They, they don't know. You know, so you've got 30,000 people somewhere in a doctor's group. They don't know where those people are in the plan of care. So they go in a hospital setting. If they're not coming back to their offices in seven days, they don't know where they are. So I think what you'll see next is a push for the IT side, that there's got to be a consistent IT delivery model that allows them to track that data. Uh, so I think you'll see more legislation on you know, pushing consistent IT and, and, and measuring systems more so than clinical-based. But, but I don't see bundle payments not taking uh, – hold this time around. Capitation did not take hold in the 90s. It became a fear. And what happened is the healthcare system at that time had enough lobbying uh, you know, leverage that they were able to really push capitation away to certain some extent. Uh, that's not true today because the spend on Medicare for post acute world is so high that it's got to stay heading toward a capitated arrangement. What you will see, which I think is good for the first time, is traditionally or it has been the regulation to, to be eligible to go to a skilled nursing facility, you have a three-day hospital stay. That's been that's been relaxed for the first time. That's crazy. So you're encouraging somebody to go to the hospital for three days, so they can go to a skilled nursing facility, and their managed care contracts today and the ACOs and they'll come under bundle payments. That three-day rule is going to be waived. Uh, so you're starting to see some really good healthcare reform changes as as a result of the bundle payments coming. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. So, this is a great time to be in healthcare. So many changes, so many transitions, and it's going to be up to you guys to keep up with all of them. No pressure there. <laughs> so, um, so, again, this concludes our Breakfast with the Experts series for 2014. Uh, I hope that. You enjoyed it. I hope it was informative. And we will uh, reconvene Sorry. in February, first Tuesday in February, 
for our first breakfast with the expert for 2015. Thanks very much, uh, Lewis. We really, really, really appreciate your time. And guys, good luck with final exams and final projects. And happy holidays. Thank you.